This is a picture test in practical neuroanatomy. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer, then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the sectional anatomy of the brain. Match the following statements with the lettered labels. This is a section at the middle of the pons, showing part of the cerebellum, located posteriorly and laterally. The fourth ventricle is roofed by the superior cerebellar peduncles, A, on each side, and connected by the superior medullary velum, a thin layer of white matter. Statement 1 consists largely of fibers leaving the cerebellum, matches well with A. Note that the pons is connected to the cerebellum by the middle cerebellar peduncle, D, which consists exclusively of fibers entering the cerebellum, thus matches with statement 2. Deep to the floor of the upper part of the fourth ventricle and close to the midline is the medially located longitudinal fasciculus, medial longitudinal fasciculus. Since it's a tract of nerves which consists of ascending and descending fibers that connect vestibular and cochlear nuclei in the medulla with nuclei controlling extraocular muscles, oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens. And this tract is involved in coordinating head and eye movements. Thus, it matches with statement 3. Contains fibers that control the direction that the eyes should move. In statement 4, the muscles of mastication are supplied by fibers originating from the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Now this nucleus is located at the level of the pons. The trigeminal nerve has three sensory nuclei, mesencephalic nucleus at the level of the midbrain, the chief sensory nucleus located at the level of the pons, and the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal located at the level of the medulla and upper part of the spinal cord. But there is only one motor nucleus that is located at the level of the pons. And this motor nucleus is located medial to the chief or principal sensory nucleus of trigeminal. Both of them are at the dorsolateral area of the tegmentum. Thus E is the motor nucleus and it matches with the statement Four, origin of fibers of the muscles of mastication. In statement five, contains fibers arising from contralateral cuneate nucleus. These fibers cross the midline in the medulla at the level of the sensory decussation and they form the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus ascends the medulla to the pons, to the midbrain in its way to the thalamus. At the level of the medulla, the medial lemniscus extends dorsoventrally on either side of the midline. Once it reaches the pons, the medial lemniscus rotates in the ventral part of the pontine tegmentum so that it's aligned in a medial to lateral direction. And so it is here, it is represented in C. So therefore, C matches with 5. The fibers of the medial lemniscus they project specifically to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. On the other hand, fibers that project to the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, as in statement 6, they originate from the trigeminal sensory nuclei. And so statement 6, fibers projecting to the ventral posterior medial nucleus, they originate from the principal or chief sensory nucleus of the trigeminal located lateral to the motor nucleus and represented here in F. Which of the following fibers are specifically present in one? Are they corticospinal, corticopontine, spinothalamic, or spinocerebellar? This is a section of the midbrain showing the cerebral peduncle comprising the crust cerebri and substantia nigra. The crust is a massive ventrally located fiber bundle that contains corticopontine, corticobulbar, and corticospinal fibers. 
The corticopontine fibers, they occupy the medial and lateral portions of the crust. So the fibers are like somatotopically represented and the corticopontine fibers, they occupy the medial and lateral ends of the crust. And this is where label one is located. Corticospinal fibers, they occupy the middle region. So one represents corticopontine fibers. In the second part of the question, which of the following muscles is supplied by the nucleus in two? Is it the lateral rectus, superior oblique, or bicularis oculi, or levator palpebri superioris? Note that this section of the midbrain also shows the red nucleus and the tegmentum. Thus, it is at the level of the rostral part of the midbrain. At this level, the anterior part of the periaqueductal gray matter contains the oculomotor nucleus, while at a lower level, the ventral part of the periaqueductal gray matter contains the tro trochlear nucleus. So in this section, we are dealing with the oculomotor nucleus because it shows the red nucleus. The oculomotor nucleus supplies orbital muscles except lateral rectus, which is supplied by the abducent nerve whose nucleus is present in the caudal part of the pons, and except superior oblique muscle, which is supplied by the trochlear nerve whose nucleus is located in the caudal part of the midbrain, orbicularis oculi here in C is a muscle of facial expression and it is thus supplied by the facial nerve, whose nucleus is present, again, in the caudal part of the pons, level with the abducent nucleus. So the correct answer here is levator palpebri superioris. This muscle is supplied by the oculomotor nerve, and it's a muscle of the upper eyelid. It doesn't act on the eyeball, but yet it is supplied by the oculomotor nerve. Remember that this muscle also has a smooth muscle portion called Muller's muscle that receives sympathetic innervation from the superior cervical ganglion. Which two of the following constitute the neostriatum? This is a coronal section through the body of the lateral ventricle showing some gray masses. A is the body of the caudate nucleus, which forms a ridge along the lateral border of the floor of the central part or body of the lateral ventricle. This ridge of the caudate nucleus is just lateral to the thalamus, B, which makes the other constituent of the floor. The internal capsule is a massive fiber bundle made up of projection fibers, and it separates the thalamus, B, from the gray matter of the lentiform nucleus comprising C and D. So the lentiform nucleus is located lateral to the internal capsule. And the lentiform nucleus has a lateral part, D, which is called the putamen, and a medial part called the globus pallidus, C. This is the pale medial part of the lentiform nucleus. The globus pallidus is traversed by numerous myelinated accents that give it the pale appearance from which it is named. E is the clostrum, which is a thin layer of neurons located lateral to the lentiform nucleus and is separated from it by the external capsule of white matter. Note that the clostrum is also located medial to the insular cortex, F, and is separated from it by the extreme capsule of white matter. The terms here might be somewhat confusing, so the term corpus striatum is used to designate the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus. As I mentioned that the lentiform nucleus is made up of the putamen D and globus pallidus C, and although they are closely opposed anatomically, but the globus pallidus and the putamen are not as closely related functionally. What is closely related functionally are the putamen and the caudate nucleus. Together, the putamen and the caudate nucleus are classified as neostriatum. So it is A and D that form the neostriatum. Sometimes they are referred to as the striatum. The globus pallidus, on the other hand, is designated as the paleostriatum or the pallidum. 
identify the structure which neurotransmitter it synthesizes. This is a section of the rostral part of the pons. Beneath the lateral side of the rostral part of the fourth ventricle, note the mesencephalic tract of the trigeminal nerve. Now adjacent to it is a small collection of distinctively deep pigmented cells that constitute the locus cereulius. These are noradrenergic neurons, often classified as a component of the reticular formation. The neurons B are located in the basal part of the pons, in between longitudinally and transversely oriented fibers. The question here requires to which layer of the cerebellum do these neurons project? So the neurons here are the pontine nuclei. They receive ipsilateral corticopontine projections accompanying the longitudinal fibers. And these pontine nuclei, they project to form the transversely running pontocerebellar fibers that cross the midline to reach the cerebellum via the middle cerebellar peduncle. These fibers that project from the pontine nuclei, they constitute the mossy fibers, which synapse with neurons in the granular cell layer of the cerebellar cortex, the deepest layer. Remember that the cerebellum receives two types of afferent fibers, the mossy fibers, which have been described now, and the second type of cerebellar afferents form the climbing fibers. These climbing fibers, they originate in the inferior olivary complex of nuclei and synapse in the molecular layer of the cerebellar cortex, the most superficial layer. A 67-year-old man who is a known case of hypertension developed neurological symptoms. On examination, he was found to have hemiplegia and impaired sensations of position and movement on the left side of the body. When he was asked to protrude the tongue, it deviated to the right. Which of the shaded areas best represents the site of the lesion? This is a typical case of medial medullary syndrome resulting from a vascular lesion, such as thrombosis of the medullary branches of the vertebral artery. These branches supply the medial aspect of the anterior part of the medulla. This region is indicated by the shaded areas C and D. Hemiplegia results from involvement of the pyramidal fibers. Lesion affecting the medial lemniscus results in impairment of sense position. Both are clinical presentations of this patient. In addition to that, deviation of the tongue results from a lesion affecting the hypoglossal nerve. The nerve is formed by projections from the motor nucleus located here, and it passes anteriorly between the olive and the pyramid. So it can be caught by the vascular lesion. It is not the nucleus that is affected, but it is the nerve itself. So you can see here that these three structures, the medial lemniscus, the pyramid, and the hypoglossal nerve, are so closely related and can all be affected by ischemia resulting from the vascular lesion. The hypoglossal nerve supplies all the muscles of the tongue except palatoglossus. Now, when genioglossus, the bulkiest muscle of the tongue, is paralyzed, then the protruded tongue will deviate to the affected side, the side that cannot be protruded by genioglossus. Since the tongue of the patient deviated to the right and the lesion is a lower motor neuron lesion of the hypoglossal nerve, then it is the right hypoglossal nerve that is affected. So shaded area D is involved. Hemiplegia is affecting the contralateral side of the body. It's affecting the left side of the body because the pyramidal fibers, which are located in the right side of the medulla oblongata, are going to ultimately they re relay on left anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. They are going to degussate at lower levels. And the sensory lesion is also on the left side of the body because the medial lemniscal fibers here 
they are fibers projecting from the contralateral. They have already decussated and they project from contralateral nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. So they originate from the left side of the body. Areas A and B could similarly be involved in a vascular lesion, but in this case the lesion is mainly affecting the posterior inferior cerebellar artery that supplies posterolateral aspects of the medulla as well as the cerebellum and it results in other clinical presentation together called the lateral medullary syndrome.